Hi everyone, my name is Kaylee Wong and thank you for joining today's live stream event. Today we're really excited to walk you through the new features and functions released with Vault 1.8. This includes new Vault Diagnose command, improvements to the integrated storage autopilot feature, the general availability of Amazon Web Services support for the key management secrets engine, and many other improvements across the project. Joining me today is Justin Weisig, Senior Product Marketing Manager. And during our session today, we'll jump into our latest product features and then follow that up with the Q&A. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available after post-processing, usually within two business days. And then lastly, if you could please type your questions in the question box and we'll answer them during our Q&A session at the end. With that, let's jump into it and I'll turn it over to Justin. Great, thanks, Kaylee. Hey, um, welcome everyone. Let me get my slides here. So uh, as Kaylee mentioned, my name is Justin. I work on the technical marketing team here um, and I'll be pre pre sorry, and I'll be presenting the latest features of Fault 1.8. Um, so before we dive in, I just wanted to give you a brief idea about what we're going to be chatting about. So um, the Vault 1.8 release, uh, there's obviously a bunch of different features that go into it. Um, for this release, we focused on improving Vault's core workflows and making some of the uh, features a little bit more well-rounded. Um, when I talk about focusing on Vault's core workflows, um, one of the key features that we added is a new Vault Diagnose command. This um, enables sort of fast, faster troubleshooting and sort of user-friendly diagnostics of when you get into a situation when Vault won't start. We analyze the Vault configuration and give you um, useful feedback. So uh, I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of time on this particular feature because I think it's uh, pretty cool. Also uh, be demoing it and we'll sort of walk through how it works. Um, we made an improvement to integrated storage autopilot. I'll be chatting about uh, what that is. Um, we released general availability support for the key management secret engine on AWS. Uh, we've changed how licensing works a little bit. Uh, not how licensing works in terms of like how Vault is licensed, but how you um, add a license to Vault to unlock enterprise features. So we'll chat about a new license auto loading feature. We've also, um, you know, uh, improved support for the DB username customization. So I'll talk about what that feature is and then, you know, how it looked before and then what changed in uh, 1.8. And then we'll look at um, some other features. Before we dive in, um, I just wanted to mention, I'm going to paste some links here. So this is the vault. Um, in, in chat, I'm pasting this. So if you're watching the recording after the fact, um, you know, this is probably on YouTube or something. So you can go into the description underneath the video and you'll find links to all this stuff. But um, everything that I'm going to be chatting about today was covered in the Vault 1.8 blog. And uh, if you, um, so if you want to follow along or, hey, you're looking for a particular link or something like that, you can find it there. All right, so let's dive in. So what I normally like to do when I'm doing this is, um, uh, the majority of the folks that are on the call obviously have already used Vault, but um, there's always some folks that uh, haven't. So I just wanted to spend, you know, a minute or two and talk about what Vault is, why people use it, and sort of the problem it solves. So um, Vault is a central service, um, you know, for secrets management that sits on the network within your, you know, compute infrastructure, and it's used as a sort of a central store to protect secrets. So what is a secret? Well, say you have an application, you know, a traditional web app. Um, you know, you have a web app and it's connecting to some database. Even in this simple example, you're going to have some sort of a, you know, username and password that your web app needs to connect over to your database. Um, so how do you actually um, do that? You know, you might be embedding that uh, username and password right into your web app, you know, in that connection string, say it's MySQL or something like that. You might have like, uh, you know, your username and then your password and that's how you make your connection. Um, we call this sort of like secret sprawl, 
you know, you might have that sitting in the actual source code that might be sitting in a Git repository that might get uploaded to um, say GitHub or something like that. That that's sort of a, a mild case of it. The the things that are, are really, I guess, harmful is when you leak API keys. You know, if you have a API key, say for AWS infrastructure or something like that, sitting in some config file, that gets checked into Git and that gets uploaded. Obviously, that's a problem. So what the core use case of Vault is to sort of provide this central place where you can put secret data. And then instead of hard coding secrets right into your applications, you make an API call over to Vault and say, hey, can I have that uh, secret username and password for um, you know, my web app or you know, from my web app over to my database? And then Vault will reply. That's a very simple use case. Um, you know, Vault's sort of like a Swiss army knife. We have over, um, I don't know, at least 50 plus integrations, both on the secret engine side, as well as, um, you know, integrating with, uh, you know, all sorts of cloud providers and, um, you know, databases and things like that. One of the sort of guiding principles is that we're not really focusing on human, you know, human people wanting to go in and pull passwords out like a traditional password manager. This is meant very much for machine to machine access. So, hey, I'm a, a web app. I need access to a database. Hey, I'm a, some sort of a application. I need to generate a certificate for you know my PKI infrastructure or something. I'll go over to Vault and I'll generate it. So those kind of use cases. Um, you know, a lot. Uh, one of the other guiding principles is hey, we really want to extend and integrate Vault. So chances are, if you have some application and you know, it requires secret data. Um, either we'll have an integration for it, or you can use the API, you know, this sort of API driven uh, philosophy that I was talking about, where you can integrate it with um, Vault. So there's a rich ecosystem that's constantly being updated. I just want to, I noticed there's a couple chat messages. So um, if you have uh, questions, I'd probably throw them into the Q&A section. There should be a little box in Zoom just so that I can like track them, but I'll, I'll see what these ones are. Perfect. All right. So one final slide here on sort of the Vault 101 piece. There's three different ways you can actually run Vault. Um, the, by, far the most open, by far the most popular version is the open source uh, you know, project. It's uh, a large open source project up on GitHub. And there's you know thousands of people that are you know working on Vault and millions of people that are you know downloading Vault and running it, and so it's uh, you know self-managed. You know you download it and you support it yourself, and it's always free. There's sort of another version of it, which is we take the open source version, we add enterprise features to it, things like you know high availability, disaster recovery some advanced uh, data encryption and tokenization features also sit in there. That's self-managed. Um, so you'll chat with HashiCorp, you'll get a license for Vault, and then you'll go and you know run your own custom deployment. That can be in your own data centers, or it'll be you know some sort of a hybrid of your data centers in the cloud. There's a third version, which is you know a, a managed offering from HashiCorp, which basically um, you know, you sign up to XCP, which is HashiCorp uh, cloud platform, and you can run a managed service of Vault. So uh, what this is, is you go in there, click a button that says, hey, I want to, um, you know, get a Vault cluster, and HashiCorp will actually manage it for you. Um, so that's sort of the spectrum of, you know, how people are using Vault. The reason I wanted to sort of focus this on uh, for a minute is because, you know, in each Vault release, you'll see features and improvements that sort of target each area. So, you know, there's a bunch of open source improvements that went into this release. There are some enterprise improvements that went in as well, as well as during the um, timeframe for Vault 1.7 to 1.8, we launched a, uh, you know, a new tier into the uh, cloud platform. You know, if we have time at the end, I'll, uh, I'll demo this for you too. Cool, so let's dive in. So the first feature that I wanted to chat about is um, uh, Vault Diagnose. So troubleshooting is sort of a fundamental task that you know Vault operators will go through. However, um, 
you know, Vault often sits in the critical path. When I chatted about, um, you know, hey, we have that web app and it's uh, chatting with a database uh, to get its credential. Well, Vault is down for some reason. Um, you know, now that web app can't get that credential to talk to the database. So Vault sort of sits in the critical path of a lot of requests. And, was, and when Vault is down, obviously that presents a big problem because chances are your you know, website or some sort of critical infrastructure is down. So we want to improve the experience of how you can quickly diagnose and sort of get to the root cause of problems. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just jump right into the demo and then I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm just going to switch screens here. So um, I have a directory here and I have, um, you know, this is obviously a simplified example, but you might have, you know, when you're running vault, you might have a, you know, a server configuration file. You might have some certificates of, you know, how people securely connect to vault. And then I'll just uh, show you the, what the server looks like here. So, you know, we might have a, some configuration then here that says, hey, how do people connect to Vault? Um, you know, what are some TTLs? You know, how, where's my storage live? You know, what, what ports am I listening on? What are the credentials that people can uh, chat with me about? Um, you know, I might have some local storage to this uh, server. Um, so let's give an example of say, uh, hey, you know what? My Vault cluster has been up and running for a long time. Um, someone deployed a config change behind the scenes uh, while Vault was still running. All of a sudden you went through some type of maintenance event and you need to restart Vault. When you restart Vault, it doesn't come up. And now all of a sudden you're in the situation of, okay, Vault's in the critical path, my applications are down and you're, you're all of a sudden troubleshooting what, what the root cause could be for this. So here's where I wanted to sort of chat about um, this new operator command called Vault Diagnose. So we'll run Vault. Um, oh, by the way, I'm running, you know, vault 1.8.2. Uh, we'll do vault operator diagnose. Uh, so you can run the help command if you want. This will just tell you, you know, how to, how to use the command. But uh, I already have uh, it set up here. So I'm going to run, I'm going to import a config, and I'm going to show you that config file that I was just uh, looking at. You know, on the face of it, this command seems sort of obvious, like, hey, we should have had it the entire time. And that's sort of, um, you know, how useful I think you're going to find this command. So um, I just wanted to sort of walk you through at a high level, uh, all the errors and sort of warnings that we ran into. And then we're going to go through one by one of that configuration file and sort of fix them. So um, one check that we uh, do right off the bat is we look at sort of, you know, OS, you know, parameters. Hey, you know, is the disk on the system totally full? Um, so you'll see some disk checks in here. So this just sort of just checks off common things that you're going to run into. Of hey, these are problems that uh, you might see. Actually, I should I should mention that um, this idea came to us, um, I guess, through the product management team and engineering as they were working with the support organization looking at. Um, you know, enterprise vault tickets. So everything you're seeing in here is typically something, uh, you know, a customer has actually run into. So we went through all serve one and serve two tickets. We looked at what the root causes were, and then we coded those into this uh, feature. So, um, you know, everything in here is typically something someone has run into. That's why we're um, putting it in here. So I, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, alrighty. So, you're going to see, uh, hey, you know, we're checking if the disk partitions are full. One particular support ticket had, um, you know, a customer had run into the open file limit uh, for their OS. So here we're performing a check to say, hey, you know, what's the open file descriptor limit? Um, nothing critical in here that I can see so far. Hey, we see a couple interesting warnings in here about, you know, an unsupported command. We probably want to go check that out. Um, we're seeing something in here about how console storage isn't working. So 
Um, I'll chat about this in a second when we go back into the config file. I just want to sort of give a high level of some of the things that we're finding here. Um, what else? Okay, looks like, um, you know, we're having some sort of a, a problem connecting to, you know, back end storage. So, so say, for example, hey, you know, vaults down, I'm trying to fire it back up. This gives you some sort of areas that you can get pointed into that you might want to do some debugging. So first off, we found out that, hey, you know, we open file descriptors, we got a warning about that, that doesn't seem like a immediate problem. Hey, you know, look like there was some storage checks that looks okay. But we see some sort of serious problems here. You know, there was a failure. We couldn't talk to the backend storage. Uh, hey, we couldn't connect to um, you know uh, cluster peers. So what are we going to do about that? So let's go and look into uh, the server config file. Um, so you can see, hey, okay, we had an issue with console. Since this is just a demo, I'm just going to comment this out just so we're not using console anymore, and that that check will now uh, pass. But say, for example, you're using console as a storage backend when you're interacting with Vault. So um, this would be, I think, a red flag to point you in that direction that, OK, Vault is actually probably OK. Uh, it's actually the backend storage that's hosted within console that you need to go investigate. Um, we also noticed that, hey, this backend file was having some sort of an issue. So that's located uh, you know, in this data file. So let's go check that out, too. Actually, let's just run this again and we should see that console uh, check passed. So we don't see console in here anymore. Now we're seeing this, um, you know, we can't access this particular data directory. So let's go uh, check that out. Oh, looks like that data directory is actually a file. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna delete that. Obviously this is an example, you're not gonna be deleting data and stuff like that, but um, we'll rerun this file. Now you can say, Okay, hey, my uh, backend storage looks like it's working. You know, well, uh, it looks like it vault when created that uh, data directory. Great. Um, there was also an interesting warning up here about, um, you know, uh, unsupported command. Let's go look at uh, what that is. So a very common thing that you're going to run into, and you know, I've done this myself, is um, when you're uh, putting together a config file, there's an extra R, you know, uh, or you might have a, you might go in here and you might have like a HTTP SS or something like that. So we wanted to catch a lot of sort of syntax issues, you know, both in sort of the keys and the values. So we're going to go through and we're going to check all that stuff. So I'm going to rerun this after fixing that uh, spelling mistake. Great. We've cleaned up those errors. Another thing that you're gonna um, that we've added is uh, so right here you're saying you know we weren't able to initialize the vault certificate so when people are connecting to vault you know typically uh, all the traffic we recommend is encrypted and so you're gonna have these certificates sitting here so you're gonna have a certificate and then uh, the key and you can see here that hey you know there was some sort of issue with the uh, certificate I just created you know blank files here but um, so obviously it's uh, warning us about that. But uh, another check that we added in here is that if your certificates are expired, it'll also give you a warning. So say, um, you know, Vault appears to be up and running, but um, you know, uh, when you connect a client, it's giving a weird error and you're not really sure what's going on. You can run the Vault Diagnose command. It'll run through all these checks. If the certificates were actually expired, you see a, a failure in here saying, hey, you know what? You need to go and update these certificates. So this is sort of a brief look. I just wanted to, you know, show you show you what's sort of happening and the types of errors that you can uncover. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the presentation now. So hopefully that kind of gives you a, you know, a high level um, sort of introduction to the, you know, the problem that we saw. This is through support tickets and, you know, actual people running into these issues. So we've taken those as a sort of set of rules and we've put them into this uh, uh, new tool. I'm, we'll also post all the you know, slides so you can find the documentation and the learn guide. Um, also, if you look at the blog post for 1.8, it'll have all the links to all this stuff. So the next feature that I wanted to chat about is um, you know, integrated storage autopilot. So 
um, I think it was Vault 1.3 or 1.4. I think it was 1.3. We initially, um, you know, added this integrated storage capability, and then 1.4 it went, um, you know, generally available. What this feature is is, okay, so we have Vault sitting on your network. It's a central place where you need to store secrets. However, you know, those secrets need to live somewhere on disk. Um, so integrated storage is a feature where Vault itself um, can maintain a, you know, a highly available cluster. So typically you'll see, you know, three nodes within a highly available cluster and those vault nodes can have integrated storage. So vault will actually look after, you know, its own database of, you know, where these secrets are and all that kind of stuff. Autopilot is a feature that sits on top of that, that does sort of proactive maintenance. You know, it'll, um, you know, periodically check to make sure that, you know, the nodes sitting in integrated storage are healthy. You know, it'll clean up failed nodes. It's doing monitoring, that kind of stuff. So with 1.8, um, we added the ability for, say you have a production cluster that's running integrated storage and you're you know, doing highly available uh, storage uh, to you know, a disaster recovery site. Uh, and you're also running integrated storage over there. We wanted to give you the capability of you know, having different configs. So uh, you know, maybe I wanna check for you know, failed clusters uh, at a different interval or something like that, or I, I wanted to, um, you know, clean up failed servers at a different interval. So it just gives you greater flexibility. Uh, it's more of a config config change. Um, all right, let's go to the next one here. The next feature that I want to chat about is, um, you know, key management secret engine. So uh, I think I'm probably just going to frame this for a second and then we'll chat about what the actual uh, feature does and, and why people are using it. So many cloud providers offer, you know, a key management service or KMS where you can sort of, you know, connect to the cloud provider. You can generate encryption keys that you can use to maintain your own root of trust. So I'm just trying to think of what an example might be. So say you're a financial institution like a bank and you know you're exploring the cloud and, but you're concerned about using the cloud providers you know provided encryption keys so you want to use the cloud providers kms you're going to generate your own encryption keys that the cloud provider doesn't necessarily you know have access to that way you can ensure that you know you're encrypting all your customer data uh, using your keys however that presents sort of a logistics problem in that uh, you know now this organization needs to manage the life cycle of these keys, right? So you might have a, depending on how large your organization is, you might have tons of different keys, right? And so now you need to maintain some sort of a, a list or spreadsheet or someone needs to be watching over these keys, making sure they're rotated and that you're not losing track of them and, and things like that. That's particularly what uh, this feature is targeted at. It acts as sort of a remote control for these cloud provider KMSs and it'll help you manage the life cycle. So when we uh, initially launched this, we launched um, uh, the feature with Azure support. And with 1.8, we added AWS KMS support in GA. So typically what we like to do is we'll go through a couple of versions where we'll you know, maybe have a technical preview. We'll, it'll go into beta and now it'll go into GA. So these features are you know, fully tested and people are using them now. Um, so we support both Azure and AWS KMS. All right, next feature I wanna chat about is, um, you know, enterprise uh, license auto loading. So before I, I mentioned about, you know, we didn't change the way Vault is, you know, licensed or anything like that. This is more about if you purchased an enterprise license to Vault, how do you unlock those capabilities? Uh, for the, you know, for open source users, this doesn't apply at all. If you're an enterprise customer, um, you know, chances are you already know about this because you've been, you know, we've proactively contacted you. This is, um, you know, sort of a change in functionality. That's why I just wanted to highlight it here for everyone. So the main problem that we we're trying to solve is um, we had a number of different ways that we actually unlocked this capability for customers. So sometimes we generated special binaries that didn't have a license in them. Sometimes we generated a special binary that had an embedded license. And some, and uh, you know, just to add a little bit more complexity, sometimes we generated a binary that had an embedded license 
that it would expire after you know 30 minutes or six hours. So the sort of what we were seeing was um, a customer might get into a situation where they think, hey, uh, you know, my enterprise binary has the license embedded, but after it's running for 30 minutes, it would stop because you know it was using that embedded license and it maybe the license wasn't actually um, you know added to the vault instance. So the change in functionality here is um, starting with 1.8, if you don't have a license, it's either going to work or it's not going to work. So you're, um, you know, if you go to start vault and it doesn't have a license, it'll, it'll, it won't start and I'll I'll put a message saying, Hey, you know what? I don't have a license. The way you can add a license is through an environment variable or through a, basically a file sitting on disk that you'll, you know, point vault to, you'll do this through the server config. So. A lot of people want to, um, you know, obviously automate how Vault is deployed. So this should be a fairly easy thing, um, you know, going forward. Or either I'm going to embed this environment variable on the instances where Vault is running, or I'm going to add this extra file and I'm going to update the config file. So I just sort of wanted to chat about the problem you're seeing and then the solution that uh, we came up with. All right, kind of a, a cool feature uh, that. Um, Vault has the capability of doing is, you know, generating a lot of dynamic credentials. So before I chatted about, um, you know, hey, I have a web app, it's connecting over to a database. Um, what you can actually do is, you know, when that web app asks for that credential to that database, you know, oftentimes when we think of secrets, we think of them as like static things. The secret always is the same. Vault has the capability to generate dynamic credentials. So Hey, I'm a web app. I go and ask for this uh, database credential. Vault can actually say, hey, you know what? Um, you're, you're the finance web app. I'm going to generate a new uh, finance credential for you. Uh, so Vault will go talk to the database. It'll go create a new username and password. And then it'll pass that back to the web app that requested it. What's really cool about this is that it allows each web app um, or person that wants to talk to this database to you know, have a unique credential. So, you know, if that credential gets compromised or something like that, or you want some sort of audit trail of, hey, you know, what did this person actually do when they connected over to that database? Or, hey, we had some sort of intrusion on this particular web app. We want to go trace what, um, you know, they had access to. You know, then you can go into the vault logs and look at, hey, what are the, you know, um, requests and audit history for this particular credential? However, um, you know, prior, I think we added this feature in 1.7. So, you know, a couple versions ago, we didn't I give you the capability to sort of customize what the name of that particular credential is. So um, starting in 1.7 and now 1.8, where we've sort of expanded the support for this feature quite a bit. So now we give you the ability to create sort of a template of what this username is going to look like. So I, this is such a sort of simple feature, but uh, it, it's sort of powerful in that, um, it gives you really good traceability into sort of who's doing what in your infrastructure when you're looking through logs to sort of trace a particular activity. So you can give a custom sort of name that says, hey, you know, I'm uh, the finance web app. Uh, you know, here's some sort of random string, you know, maybe what the role of the credential is or maybe who requested it. And then, you know, some sort of timestamp. So we really leave this up to the organization that's implementing this to come up with their own sort of naming schema. but these are just some examples. So, um, you know, say something happened and you want to go in and trace uh, sort of the activity. Now you can go into the vault audit log and you can say, okay, hey, it was the uh, finance web app. Um, this particular application uh, generated the credential and that's when it, uh, um, you know, happened. Then you can go through database logs or whatever you need it to do to sort of do that. So in 1.7, we initially launched a feature with support for uh, these databases. And then with 1.8, we expanded it uh, quite a bit. So that's um, sort of the bulk of the features that I wanted to chat about. But obviously, there's a lot more that goes into a release. And so I just wanted to highlight a, a couple of those things. So um, Apple's uh, released the a new Mac, the M1 Max, and we added support for, you know, we, we cut a particular binary that's, um, you know, built for the ARM64 uh, Apple M1. So, you know, if you have one of those new uh, laptops and you want to go play around with Vault, obviously we want to support that. Um, we've updated the uh, Google Cloud or GCP uh, secrets engine. 
now supports um, you know, managing access to tokens or keys for existing uh, service accounts. A cool one if you're using uh, Red Hat OpenShift. So uh, we got our Helm chart certified. So now um, uh, also our image is certified. So if you, you know, want to run, you know, uh, Vault in a Red Hat OpenShift environment, you should be totally supported there. We, we already had support for all of this, but, uh, you know, we've partnered with Red Hat and we've gone through the certification process. So now it's been vetted on the Red Hat side too. So you should uh, be good to go there. We added a, a ServiceNow credential um, uh, capability. And also if you're using Active Directory, I guess this applies to LDAP too. So underneath the hood where we obviously support LDAP, uh, you know, and getting credentials. And then, you know, Active Directory sits on top of that. So uh, this really applies to both Open LDAP and Active Directory, but I just threw Active Directory in here. So we added the ability to, um, you know, uh, rotate sort of on-demand or manual Active Directory credentials that are, so say for example, hey, you know, I have a script, I need to go execute something in my Windows environment and I need a credential, you can go get that, but you can also manage that credential with uh, Vault. That's sort of it for the talk. So I did wanna show you one more thing. So we've launched a new, uh, let me just exit out of the, uh, uh, presentation here. So at the beginning here, I chatted about, you know, there's three ways to run Vault. One's the open source version, one's the enterprise, and one's the cloud. I wanted to go and actually show you what the cloud uh, version looks like. Uh, maybe just let me, um, I think this should be viewable to everyone. So, um, you know, if you're looking to play around with, you know, HashiCorp Vault and you're looking for a managed service, um, you know, typically what we find is uh, varying degrees of, uh, you know, particularly on the enterprise side, some people really want to run Vault themselves and they have the internal ex expertise to do it. Um, however, there's also a big shift to, you know, managed services. Hey, I'm using all these managed services in the cloud. It'd be great if HashiCorp, uh, you know, provided a managed service. So that's where this comes from. We have sort of three different tiers. One's development, starter, and then standard. And you can see sort of the, um, you know, cluster sizes and what sort of the composition of the cluster looks like. So we have a dev tier, you know, if you want to sort of kick the tires with Vault, um, you can do that. All new accounts get $50 in credit. So with this uh, development tier, you can run, you can play around with Vault for, uh, I think it's a couple months, uh, you know, and, and we'll cover it. Um, I just wanted to show you what this actually looks like. Uh, let me, I'm going to post the uh, link here into the chat. So if anyone's sort of interested in playing around with this, uh, they can. Great. So when you first, uh, full size this. when you like come into the HashiCorp uh, HCP cloud platform, this is sort of the dashboard that you're going to see. Um, so we offer, you know, a managed version of console as well as a managed version of vault and you can see Terraform in here and then, you know, some billing settings. So say, hey, I'm interested in sort of playing around with vault. I want to go through a particular, you know, tutorial or something like that. You can just go and click on deploy cluster. Um, we have a development here. This isn't meant for production. It's just, hey, I want a single node instance that's, you know, fairly small. I just want to play around with a you know, a particular feature, I want to prototype something or something like that. You know, you give it uh, uh, a name, you select the cluster you want, you say, hey, uh, right now we're only running in AWS with this. So, you know, you can peer with your AWS environment or you can give it a public connection that sits out on the actual internet. We don't recommend this obviously for production because it's, you know, sitting out on the open internet. But if you want to prototype something just from you know, your, your desktop or your laptop and you want to connect into a vault instance, you can just flip this on and we'll give you a public IP address. Um, however, once you sort of graduate, hey, I want to, um, you know, actually run this in production or something like that, you can uh, switch over to a starter or standard tier. In here, we give you, you know, lots of different cluster sizes, um, you know, right up to, you know, pretty large clusters. Um, 
I think that's it. I have a, a cluster up and running already. You know, it's running vault 1.81. Now you can come in here. Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny when I look at this, it seems, you know, very simple. All, but we've abstracted away or we've abstracted away sort of all the complexity. You know, you don't need to be worry about, hey, um, you know, what does the config file look like? Hey, what is the logging monitoring? Um, you know, hey, is someone looking after the cluster? This is all managed by the our global SRE team. So you can really just focus on, hey, what are the workflows that I want to enable? And we'll look, at, we'll look after the other stuff. Um, so you can generate a token and you can, you know, connect to the public or private addresses and stuff like that. Alrighty, so that's pretty much all I wanted to chat about. I'm gonna go back to the uh, presentation and then um, I'm going to just full screen this again. And then I'm, uh, so if you have any questions about what we chatted about or you need any links or anything like that, um, uh, just pop it in the Q and A section and I'll answer it. All right, so there's three questions. Just uh, bear with me how you got to read these and then uh, you know go through the answers here. Um, so there's a question in here. I assume it's about um, you know integrated storage. It says, you know, is there a redundancy between uh, you know storage nodes um, during failover? You know, what's the time frame for recovery and stuff like that? So I think what this is chatting about is this. Um, you know, integrated storage feature. So uh, maybe I'll talk about sort of what happens behind the scenes and how this actually works. So when you're running Vault, obviously you need access to a storage system that, you know, has sort of the database of, you know, secret data that you put into uh, Vault. So uh, you'll typically, when you're bootstrapping an integrated storage system, you know, you're going to fire up one node. I'm going to say, hey, this is an integrated storage cluster. Then what you're going to do is you're going to um, start typically two other instances, but you can go higher from there depending on your redundancy requirements. And you're going to join them to this cluster. So once you have three nodes, we typically consider this a, you know a highly available cluster. What's happening? Um, we're using the Raft protocol. If you want to you know Google that or something, how it, how it works behind the scenes. Uh, we also have lots of technical documentation. Maybe I'll I'll post the. Um, I'll just post the documentation in chat here. Uh, just one sec. Just pasting this so you have it. Yeah, so behind the scenes, you know, we're, we're creating this raft cluster. And what's happening is that, um, you know, all the nodes are communicating their status with each other to say, hey, you know what, I'm healthy, I'm up and running. They're sending sort of, um, like, I don't know, I guess I describe it as, you know, heartbeats between the nodes so that they all know, hey, I, I'm alive, uh, you know, I'm accepting traffic. Within that cluster, we're going to elect a leader. So, you know, typically the first node that you actually bootstrap the cluster with, let's just call it node one, that would be the leader of the uh, cluster. Um, and then the other nodes would be followers. So if all of a sudden there's some interruption with that, uh, you know, heartbeat and the leader of the cluster is unresponsive, there'll be a leader election between the two existing healthy nodes and they'll be, um, you know, elected. What's cool about, uh, you know, integrated storage is that any node within that cluster is capable of servicing requests. Um, so you shouldn't typically wouldn't notice, you know, uh, you know, a downtime event or something like that when you're running an integrated storage cluster because, uh, the it is self-healing you know they'll perform uh, a leader election internally and they'll just resolve it obviously you know if node uh, one is down you're going to want to have you know monitoring on the infrastructure side that says hey you know what um, you know vault used to be listening on this port now it's not or hey the instance went away so you know vault will look after you know sort of what it's um capable of looking after, but you also have a responsibility on the infrastructure side too, to make sure it's uh, healthy. So hopefully, you know, that's a little bit long winded answer and I gave you some documentation. So hopefully that uh, covers the uh, question there. Um, sorry, I'm just reading the uh, question here. Um, 
There's another question about integrated storage of, hey, what's the minimum number of nodes? Uh, it's three. We recommend uh, three nodes. You know, typically, you know, obviously you don't want to have one node. You know, if that goes down, um, uh, you're, you have a, a single point of failure. If you have two nodes, it's, um, we don't recommend that. You know, if, if you have a high amount of traffic going to vault, uh, you know, and, and one node falls over, it's just going to cascade and uh, kill the other node too. So, you know, the minimum that we recommend is uh, three nodes for integrated storage cluster. Um, I think I actually, um, so there's a question uh, here about, um, you know, sort of, uh, hey, I'm running integrated storage. Uh, I never chatted about this, so I'm just going to explain something for a second. So, um, you know, obviously, if you're running Vault uh, and it's storing all of your secrets, you don't want Vault just to come up in an unlocked state. So we have this um, concept of Vault being sealed. So Vault can be booted, you know, Vault, the actual service. Uh, however, it might be in a sealed, sealed state. It basically means, you know, it needs to be unlocked so that it can actually service requests. So how do you unlock Vault? How do you unseal it? Um, we give you a, a series of unsealed keys. So this might be an actual operator at the command line entering an unseal uh, key. However, say it's two in the morning and you're, um, uh, you know, you're sleeping and Vault's running away. And then all of a sudden it um, has some sort of event where it needs to, you know, reboot or something like that. And it comes up in a sealed state. Obviously, that's not good because um, you know you're going to get up and go and unseal Vault. So to deal with that, we have something called auto unseal. This is where Vault can you know integrate with uh, you know if you're running your own data centers, you can integrate it with the HSM. You can have the unseal key there, so Vault will you know connect over to the HSM and say, hey, um, you know what's my unseal key? It'll authenticate with the HSM and it'll unlock itself. Um, if you're on a cloud provider, we also uh, uh, you know, offer something called uh, cloud auto unseal. This is where it can work with a cloud provider to, you know, use the cloud provider's KMS to auto unseal. So, um, sorry for that sort of background context, but the, the question is that, you know, hey, I'm using integrated storage. Uh, you know, can I unlock um, uh, Vault using a cloud ASM, um, KSM? And the question is, yes, you can. Or the answer is, yes, you can. Um, so there's a, another question in here of saying, hey, is autopilot uh, an enterprise feature? So uh, autopilot uh, by itself is not an enterprise feature. This is baked right into uh, open source. However, um, the particular feature here of you know, DR secondary, that is an enterprise feature. So sort of back when I chatted about you know, the different flavors of Vault, uh, this particular autopilot feature spans, you know, both open source. So, yeah, you can uh, create a highly available cluster using, you know, integrated storage and have this autopilot feature that sort of manages the cluster health for you. However, uh, you know, disaster recovery. Hey, I have, you know, maybe I'm running in, um, you know, AWS, US West, and US East. And hey, I want to have uh, you know Vault sync credentials over for me in a in a disaster recovery scenario. Um, that's an enterprise feature. So, um, you know, that's why this um, you know DR secondary cluster config. Uh, that's why it falls into a, a enterprise feature is because you know this DR secondary uh, functionality is part of enterprise. Uh, there's another question in here about you know what's the use case for uh, integrated storage. I think we sort of already touched on it, but maybe I'll just uh, cover it one more time. So uh, since Vault is a central service, you know, and a lot of machines are looking for passwords, you want to make sure it's up, you know, all the time. Uh, and so integrated storage is a feature where you can basically create highly available storage from within Vault itself. And, you know, the nodes will look after it. Um, so that's sort of the use case of why you'd want to use, um, you know, integrated storage. Sorry, just bear with me. I'm just reading through the uh, questions here. Uh, 
There's a question in here about, um, you know, have you modified your uh, guidance about open file descriptors? You know, I noticed in your fault diagnosed demo that, um, uh, you know, I, you had it set pretty low. Like on my, uh, I'm just using a Mac laptop here. So it, it was, uh, you know, set very low. I'm not running Vault in production here. It, however, it asks, hey, what's the guidance that you actually recommend? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know the answer, but uh, we, um, and the reason I don't know it is that we have a doc, um, you know, calling Vault running in production. Let me just uh, find it here. Um, and I'll paste it into chat. So this will be sort of the you know definitive guide of um, you know where you should go and look, and it'll have links to you know all that set type of stuff. So I'm just gonna throw it into uh, the chat here for you. Just because there's a lot of different you know sort of config configs that we recommend, and I don't happen to know the you know file descriptor one off the top of my head. I think that's it for most of them. Um, I think I've covered most of the questions. So if I didn't answer your question, um, I apologize, first of all. And what we're going to do is at the end of this, we're going to have a, you know, a dump of all the questions or, a, you know, an export and I'll, I'll follow up with you individually if I miss something here. So um, I just want to say thanks very much for, you know, attending the, um, the chat here. Um, hopefully have all the links. I've uh, thrown them in the chat. If you're watching the replay on YouTube, you know, you can go into the description below and you should find all the links or the links to the slides that have the, all, everything you need in there. All right, Kaylee, I'm going to pop it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. And thanks, everyone, for submitting those questions in the Q&A box. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed today's live stream and is excited for Vault 1.8. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we are recording this, and we will make it available to you in about two days. So we'll send it out in an email to everyone who registered with the recording link. So thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great day.